Hi, welcome to Bromley Town Church online service. We're so glad that you have joined us today. We hope that you've been safe and well this week during this hot weather. And now as you take a moment out to focus on God, we pray that you will be blessed as you join with us in this service. Pastor Jonathan is going to be continuing his new series on the power of the cross. But first we're going to join together and worship and Emma is going to lead us. Thank you. 
day to worship at a difficult time. It is a challenge for everyone, and the challenge will be different for everyone. In our lives, plans may have changed. Jobs may have changed, finances may have changed, even shopping. But we sing now to stir our hearts. We sing to proclaim God's truth. We sing to allow our spirits to be uplifted. We can make our lives, even our worship, much more than it needs to be. But we simply come, because when all is stripped away, it's all about Jesus. He loves us. He wants to pour out his love and strength and peace on us today. So we come to receive his love.
Let's pray to our God who hears us when we pray. Father God, we want to thank you. We want to thank you because you've promised that you will hear us, that you will listen to our petitions. And we want to thank you for today. We want to thank you that we're able to meet here on, online, that we're able to share your word, that we're able to share comfort. Father Lord, we pray for all our brothers and our sisters, Father Lord, all over the world meeting today, this Sunday. We pray that in the name of Jesus, you will be with them as you are with us. We pray in the mighty name of Jesus, that by your grace, you will be with your church today. We pray for our brothers and sisters who are persecuted where they are, in countries where it is illegal to become a Christian, in countries where they're not allowed to meet freely. We pray your presence, Lord. We pray your comfort, Lord. And we pray that your grace will be with them, to cause them to be resilient, to cause them to keep on with you. Father, we pray for the people of Beirut at this time, the people of Lebanon. We pray, Lord, that you will, Father, comfort those who are weeping, that you will bring, Father, the helpers to help those who need help. And we pray for peace, Lord. We pray that the outcome will be better, Lord, than the beginning. Father, we pray concerning the train crash in Aberdeen. We pray, Lord, that you will cause there to be peace in the hearts of those who are there. That, Lord, that whole city undergoing lockdown again and now having this train crash. Father, have mercy, Lord. Have mercy in Jesus' name. We pray for this nation as we continue to go through rapid change. We pray that your peace, Lord, your peace, your peace, your peace will reign, not only in our lives as your children, but Lord, that it will permeate from us into the society, that it will permeate for, from us into our neighborhoods, that Lord, your kingdom will come. Amen. We recently finished the Alpha course online at Bromley Town Church. Uh, great success, actually. We were really delighted with how it went. And we're about to run our next one, starting on Tuesday the 15th of September at 7.30 on Zoom. And we'd like to invite you to come. If you've never been on an Alpha course before, you're thinking, oh, you know, I could benefit from this, or you know somebody, a friend, a member of the family, you're thinking, actually, you know, for years we've been talking and want to encourage them to come on this Christian Discovery course. Over about eight or nine weeks, we will be running this uh, and have a real opportunity to get to know the people uh, and the guests on there and to discuss the issues about what it is to know Jesus and who he is to us. So have a think about it. Do email me, clive at bromitownchurch.com if you want to join and we'd love you to be part of our online Alpha course. It's great to know that so many of you are still joining us online on Sunday mornings. Don't forget all our activities online are still continuing throughout the summer. And also if you'd like to join us at the Sunday live service, you'd be really, really welcome to. Just go to the Bromley Town Church website, click Sunday Live and there's a button at the bottom where you can book your seats. We'd also really like to hear from you if you've got something to share with the church about how God has answered some of your prayers. It's great to be encouraged in our faith that way. And also, if there's something that you would like us to pray with you about, then please do so. There's a prayer request page on our website, or you can email directly prayer at bromleytownchurch.com. We'd be really pleased to pray with you, whatever it is. And now it's time to mention our offering. If you'd like to give in to the kingdom work through Bromley Town Church, then please do so by going to Bromley Town Church and clicking the Give button there, or you can do so through your mobile phone, or you can do so directly through your bank online. Hi BTC Kids! This summer we're thinking about how to be a superhero and today we're going to be thinking about the superpower of kindness. So don't forget, come along 
to the BTC pages on the church's website and see you soon. Bye. to be able to do a sofa story all the way from Portugal. Portugal! And we're so excited about the new season that we're going to be entering into. As many of you know, we're expecting a baby end of October, beginning of November. And also, there's so many exciting things happening in the ministry that we look forward to sharing with you soon. Yes, perhaps a ministry update to come. But there's just one thing I think for us that God's been teaching us through this season that I'm sure he's been speaking to you about as well learning to trust him despite what we see, despite what's happening in the world, despite elections going on around the world, despite uh, uh, tragedies and obviously the virus, uh, we're choosing to trust the Lord. We've seen God uh, make a way for us as we were trusting him for a baby to come. Um, but we also just wanna say this, God's purpose for your life is still gonna take place when we choose to trust him. Uh, his destiny for Bromley Town Church is still going to happen, even though there's changing in the way that you can gather and, and meet, and uh, God's destiny for you as an individual too. So we're delighted uh, to be able to uh, just keep standing firm and standing upon the rock that is Jesus. So uh, big, big hello again, and we look forward to seeing you all soon. Bye! Bye. Good morning, good morning, welcome to Bromley Town Church. It's great to see you again. It's been a bit of a hot week this week. I don't know at what point you actually melted, but it certainly felt like I was melting during this week. Uh, but whatever, it's great to see you back at church this morning and we hope that you're well and you're blessed. Uh, last week we started this new series and we were looking at the power of the cross. And so we're going to continue with that today, looking at the power of the cross. Last week, I, as I gave the introduction to this, I mentioned that the power of the cross is that it is the place where sin is completely dealt with, uh, completely and utterly dealt with. And so if that's the power of the cross, the, that it defeats sin, then I thought it was worth looking today at the characteristics of sin, so therefore that we can see more clearly what the power of the cross is and how it is, has its ability to defeat sin. So today we're going to be looking at this wonderful subject of sin and evil. I know that that sounds a little bit heavy, but uh, I think we shall get some things from it. First of all, let's just start with a couple of definitions. Sin. What is sin? Now, if you're a Christian, you probably know, well, I know what sin is, but it doesn't hurt for us to have a definition of it. Sin is transgression of divine law. In other words, it's when we break what God has established. God says do this, if we don't do it, we're breaking his divine law, and that is sin. Equally, what is evil? Evil is morally wrong or bad. It is immoral or wicked. That's when an action or a behavior is doing those things. Now, as Christians, we probably understand, as I've already said, the word sin, because we're more accustomed to that. And we know that it's when we do something that breaks God's law. But even if you don't like the sin, and there may be somebody who says like, oh, no, 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 I'm not a sinner, I, I'm a good person, that type of uh, response. Well, okay, we dismiss the word sin, but even if we dismiss the word sin, if you were then to say to them, well, do you believe that there is evil in the world, then that person would probably say yes. You see, regardless of our religious convictions, uh, if I was to ask you, do you believe in good, you would probably say yes. Yes, I've experienced good. I like good. I want more things that are good. And equally, if I was to say to you, well, you believe in good, do you believe in evil? And they would say, yes, I've experienced evil. I've had nasty things done to me. I don't want any of that. I don't want to have anything to do with evil. We all have experienced those things. So we may not actually accept the word sin, but we do have an understanding that there is evil. Ah, but you see, listen. If we say that there is too much evil in the world, then we are assuming there is good. When we assume there is good, we also assume there is a moral law, which we use to differentiate between good and evil. And if we assume a moral law, then we're setting in place the fact that there is a moral law giver. 
One of the hallmarks of God upon all of our lives, whether we believe in him or not, is this. We have a sense of what is right and what is wrong. We have a conscience that flares up a warning to us when we start to walk in ways that are wrong, even though we may dismiss the fact that there is a moral law giver. Well, today we're going to start at the very beginning. It's a very good place to start. We're going to start by looking at the start of sin. How do we, did sin start? And in the Bible, we see that sin entered the world when Adam and Eve were first created and they rebelled against God's command. And this first sin takes place in the place called the Garden of Eden. This was a place where God had commanded Adam this, and I read from Genesis 2, verses 16 and 17. And the Lord God commanded the man, you are free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. For when you eat from it, you will certainly die. Now Eve was there, and she was tempted by the serpent that had appeared to her. Genesis 3 verse 1. Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God really say, you must not eat from the tree in the garden? And Eve replied, we may eat fruit from the trees in the garden, but God did say, you must not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden, and you must not touch it or you will die. Now the serpent replies to Eve, he says this, Genesis 3 verses 4 and 5, you will not certainly die, the serpent said to the woman, for God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Now at this point, having heard these things, Eve felt to herself, maybe God has been holding out on us. It seems like he's been actually preventing us from gaining some information. And this serpent is telling us things that we've not heard before, things that we can gain. Is God really for us or is he against us? You can almost sense that that is going on in Eve's thinking. Genesis 3 verse 6, it says, When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. She also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate it. Now, of course, at this point, they were violating the command that God had given. And so sin had taken place. They were transgressing. They were going over the mark that God had set for them. And having opened that doorway to sin, we see that man is now under the influence of sin. In Romans 5.12, Paul teaches this. When Adam sinned, he said, sin entered the world. Adam's sin brought death. So death spread to everyone, for everyone sinned. Rebelling against God's instructions, his command, is how sin began. And this is how the whole power of evil was unleashed into the world. It's interesting, I've been reading to you from Genesis chapter 3. You only have to go into the very next chapter when we start to read of Cain and Abel, that is Adam and Eve's two sons, and how that Cain rises up against his brother and murders him. It seems like sin has just entered the world in chapter 3, and here we are, chapter 4, and already somebody is being murdered. Once the doorway of the, is opened, it seems like a tide of evil starts to flood in. And in actual fact, in Genesis, when you read two further chapters on, in chapter 6, verses 5 and 6, we read this. The Lord observed the extent of human wickedness on the earth, and he saw that everything they thought or imagined was consistently and totally evil. So the Lord was sorry he had ever made them and put them on the earth. It broke his heart. Sin is a power, and it's a power that seems to grip our lives to the extent that we end up doing things that we don't really necessarily want to do. I don't want to lie, I don't want to cheat, I don't want to deceive, I don't want to be arrogant, I don't want to be proud, I don't want to be selfish, and yet the very things I don't want to do, I often find are the things that I am doing, because there is a power in sin. And that is why God, when he was talking to Cain and Abel, when he said to Cain, he said, if you do what is right, will you not be accepted? But if you do not do what is right, Sin is crouching at your door. It desires to have you, but you must rule over it. 
Sin has a power and that power has affected the very nature and that nature of ours wants to direct our lives in a way that God doesn't want. And we have to learn to master that power of sin. That's the start of sin, that breaking of God's law, that doing what is morally wrong. So we have seen the start of sin, how that came into the world and how that began to affect us. But now I want to look at this and I'm going to look at four different points. What I want to look at is the effect that sin has or the effect that sinning has upon our lives. And we're going to look at four things as I say. The first one of these is that sin separates. Sin separates. The problem with sin is that it separates. Primarily it separates the creation from the creator. God wanted to have communion with his creation. In fact, in the beginning, with Adam and Eve, before they sinned, they wanted to have communion together. They wanted to have life together. And yet now we see, because of sin, there is a separation. Adam and Eve, once they had sinned, they were put out of the Garden of Eden. There was a separation that had, that, that had to take place. And the disdain that they had shown for God's commands caused that to happen. Have we ever experienced that in a relationship? I know that for myself, there was another pastor I knew here in Bromley, and one day we were doing some events, and we were inviting people to the church or theatre to some events that we were doing there as churches together. I saw him and very excitedly he said, oh, you must come, you need to do this, get your people to come. And he'd had some complications and problems in his own church, and he was very hesitant. And he said, oh, no, you don't understand why I can't come. And I said, yes, I do understand, and putting myself as though I knew exactly what he was going through. And at that point there was a difficulty, there was a separation, and in fact from that point there was a real coldness in the relationship. Something had happened, there was a disagreement, even though it wasn't meant to happen, it was just through words, but something happened. Now I'm very glad to say that a while after that I was able to meet with this particular person and just through forgiveness everything was put right and that relationship is back on track. But the point I wanted to make is this, is that there was something that came between us and it caused a division. Now that was just in a normal relationship. A disagreement, a misunderstanding, taking a wrong view, it caused a disagreement and it caused separation in a normal relationship. Have you ever understood that? Have you ever had the same sort of thing with yourself, with a friend of yours or something? You know that something happens and a barrier comes and you've got to deal with that barrier before the relationship can move on. Now that is exactly what I'm talking about as far as sin is concerned. When we sin, it causes a separation in the relationship between us and God. There is a barrier. Now, you can carry on, and you can try and talk to God, and you can try and make relationship, but really the issue is, when are we going to talk about this barrier that is coming between us? When are we going to deal with that issue that is separating us? Sin separates us from God. It is a real issue. And I know some people will say, like, well, I'm not that bad. I mean, I haven't robbed banks. I haven't done this sort of thing. But you know what? It doesn't matter. It's just if we have broken one of God's laws, and in actual fact the Bible actually says, for all have sinned. But the Apostle James puts it like this, James 2 verse 10. For the person who keeps all the laws except one is as guilty as a person who has broken all of God's laws. For the same God who said you must not commit adultery also said you must not murder. So if you murder somebody but do not commit adultery, you have still broken the law. We can sin at just one point and we're guilty as if we had sinned in many different points. The fact is a barrier comes between us when we sin and that sin separates us. Sin separates. Secondly, sin enslaves. Uh, John 8 verse 34, Jesus said this to his disciples. Jesus replied, I tell you the truth, everyone who sins is a slave to sin. And the analogy there is that, that of a slave and his master. The slave obeys his master because the slave belongs to his master. We sin because sin is our master. And until we get a new owner, we're still locked in that position of enslavement. You know, we read about migrants coming across the channel to this country, or indeed going to other countries. And we know that often a migrant can go to a country, and obviously when they get there, wow, I've managed to get across the border, and they're seeking then to find work, they're seeking then to earn money. And some unscrupulous people may say, hey, I'll give you a job. But of course they know that they're migrants, they know that they haven't got the right to be in the country, and so they then start to uh, treat them badly. 
And from the point of view, they enslave them. That's modern day slavery, or it can be. And in those situations, the migrant themselves knows that they can't get out of it because if they do or say something against the, this, this person, then they're going to just be reported to the police and get thrown out of the country. There's an enslavement, an entrapment that happens. And you know, that's exactly what sin does. It keeps us trapped. It feels like we can't get out of it. We've broken God's commands and evil has entered the world and it's taken a grip on us. And it encourages us to carry out its desire. Sin separates, sin enslaves. And thirdly, sin hardens. When we keep walking in sin, it actually causes our hearts to become hardened, to become calloused. Now, I don't know whether you do any manual work. For myself, I've got fairly soft hands, but if I do any manual work fairly quickly, I'll start to get blisters come up on my hands. Because when you're using a tool or something and there's that vibration or irritation on your hand, your hand reacts to say like, whoa, that's not, I'm not used to that sort of pressure. I'm not used to that. Uh, so a blister forms. And in time, the blister goes hard and eventually hard skin starts to form in that area. Because your body is saying, look, I need to protect the hand, in this case, I need to protect the hand from damage, so I'll make it calloused. And in the same way, if we carry on, our bodies or our minds can actually say, listen, that's not right to walk in. You shouldn't be doing those things. But when we continue to sin in the same fashion, it's like our minds get hardened, it's like our hearts get calloused. We start to put a, a covering over it so that we no longer feel the, the, the prompting of our conscience, but rather we get numbed to that. There is a hardness that comes, and that is what sin does. It hardens our hearts so that the Holy Spirit no longer can bring the same conviction to our hearts, or rather we no longer have the same sensitivity to respond to that conviction. The writer to the Hebrews writes this in chapter 3, verses 12 and 13. See to it, brothers and sisters, that none of you has a sinful, unbelieving heart that turns away from the living God. But encourage one another daily, as long as it is called today, so that none of you may be hardened by sin's deceitfulness. Sin can harden our hearts, and it's like a callous that can develop over our minds so that we carry on sinning and we have no conscience. Sin separates, sin enslaves, sin hardens, and finally, sin deceives. Now, to deceive means this, to mislead by false appearance or statement, to delude. So, in other words, you're being told something, but it's not the whole truth. But you're being led into believing that that was the truth, so you go along with it. That is what deception is. And the very essence of sin is that it deceives you. It promises you more than it can deliver. It promises you, uh, and you only actually get a fraction of what, it's, uh, uh, what it said it was going to deliver. It's like a drug. From the point of view, you don't quite get what you wanted, so you keep going back for more in the hope that soon you're going to get what you actually were looking for, the payout that you were hoping for, but it doesn't deliver. Instead of getting what you want, you end up with nothing. An American baseball star once confessed to Ravi Zacharias in one of his meetings, where Ravi had been talking about uh, living our lives uh, in, in a godly way, or being accountable to God, or even how easy it is sometimes for us not to be accountable to God and falling into sin. And this American baseball star came up to Ravi and he said, listen, he said, I have all the money I need, but I have lost everything of value that I ever possessed because he had been walking in sin. Sin deceives. It tells us what we can do, it tells us what we could have, but when we actually turn to it, we find out that we're not getting what we hope for. Indeed, we could end up losing what has real value to us. Sin deceives us. It deceives us in relationships where we think we're in a relationship, but suddenly we think, hey, relationship with that other person would be far better. We're in a situation where we've got some money, but hey, if I only had more money, then I would be in a far better position. It tends to give us little snippets of truth. But as we go for these things, we find that they don't actually offer what we are looking for. The essential character of sin is that it separates, it enslaves, it hardens, it deceives. And lastly, I want to mention one further thing. 
God hates sin. And he has announced that the wage, if you like, the due, the right reward for each and any sin is eternal death. Because God is holy, that is, he is utterly pure, utterly righteous, utterly true, he must punish sin. In Isaiah 13 verse 11 it says this, I will punish the world for its evil, the wicked for their sins. So sin not only separates, enslaves, hardens and deceives, but it is also going to be punished with an eternal death. That is but for the power of the cross. And John 3, 16 and 17 we read this, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. And in Acts 4, verse 12, salvation, it says, is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved. That is except the name of Jesus. The cross has the power to deal with sin in our lives. And we can see the effects that sin can have. We know and feel the effects that sin can have, because often, although we don't talk about it, these things affect our lives. But we know that there is a power in sin, but there is a greater power in the cross. And that power can set us free. And next week we're going to be looking at that power as we look at the work of the cross. So I want to encourage you, come back next week and listen to more as we understand more about the power of the cross and how it can affect our lives. Let's hope this week you have a good week. May God bless you. May God's presence and his spirit go with you to strengthen you and to encourage you. We'll see you next week. Bye-bye.
Pastor Jonathan for shedding some light on sin and its consequences. Sin certainly separates and deceives. You know what is so noticeable about this story of Adam and Eve is that the outcome they got was so far removed from what the enemy had led them to believe they would get by going against God's word. Uh, and rather than fully trusting in what God had told them, uh, they allow the enemy to cause them to doubt. And so they resorted to making a decision based on their senses. The Bible says she saw uh, that the fruit was good and she took an act. And that's what the enemy tries to make us do today. Uh, the enemy tries to make us to doubt God's word. And so we resort to making decisions based on how we feel, uh, what we see, what we hear, uh, rather than just fully trusting in what God has said. You know, in Psalm 119 verse 11, the Bible says, Your word I have hid in my heart that I might not sin against you. And that truly is what we ought to do as Christians. We ought to hide God's word in our hearts so we don't sin against it. But you know, I'm so grateful and thankful that when we sin, we have a God who is able, ready, willing to forgive us our sins when we come before him and we ask. And that's what we should do right now. Let's pray together. Father God, I just want to thank you. I want to thank you that you are a God of mercy. I want to thank you that you are a God who forgives. And we come before you today to say, Lord, we know we have sinned. We know we have done wrong. We have gone against your word, your instructions. We're asking you to please forgive us our sins. Please cleanse us and renew us in your spirit and in your truth. We ask forgiveness for our nation. We pray, Lord, forgive us and help us and restore us. And all this we ask in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. If you've prayed that sincerely, then be convinced. Know that he has forgiven you because that's his word. Amen. Right. Leaves for me to remind you to visit our website www.bromleytownchurch.com especially for the BTC Kids and the BTC Foundation there's material on there don't miss it and have a great week and I will see you soon